alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ahkam SOS, the show that discusses duties and practices by His Eminence, the Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi Hafadullah. And this season we'll also be looking at different other maraja and their opinions on certain uh, rulings. I'm your host, Mohsin Shah, and joining me is Sheikh Ali Ma'ar. Assalamu alaykum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, now we've been discussing the last couple of episodes. We looked at youth and, and you know, how the center should be uh, involved with the youth. We looked at what sort of, um, you know, um, aspects of their life that we should be considering. For example, we should be helping them with uh, decision making in terms of education, in terms of career. We should be helping facilitate for their marriages. If they want to go into business, inshallah, financially support them. Does health also come into this? Should the leaders of our community take the health of the youth into consideration? A'udhu billah as-sami'an alim minash shaytan ar-rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tayibin al-tahirin Allahumma salli ala al-Sayyid he mentions this mas'ala and he says that it is mandatory, it is wajib for the youth's leadership, those who um, are responsible to lead a group of youth, for example, uh, let's say in a community, community, as a community leader or youth, youth leader, that they have to also have the concern about the health of the youths. And especially nowadays and what's happening in, in, in this world that we live in, in this day and age, we see that depression, anxiety, mental he health issue is rising and even within the Muslim uh, community. That's why they need support. They need mental support, they need psychological support, they need face-to-face -face support. Um, in this case, we have to facilitate that in somehow. Now, in some countries, uh, the health system pays for these treatments and uh, they take care of it, but some countries they don't. So um, the Muslim community should uh, encourage for those who are able to support, to um, help, for example, the youth. And as the state says, to, for example, to um, offer the health insurance cover for the, for the youth. So if they fall into such issues, mm -hmm. they're recovered. There's a, uh, um, an organization who can pay for their treatment. And of course, they have access to uh, the doctors, professionals who can, and experts who can uh, talk to them and, su and support them. And of course, religious support is again another way in which the one can seek and get help from by making them to uh, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the hereafter, the jannah, the par paradise, the rewards, for example, and the importance of uh, participating in the majalis, for example, and not to stay away from the majlis or from the community for any reason, for any excuse, and so forth. That can also help uh, in this regard. And of course, um, the charity organizations can also help and support each individual separately with this issue. Of course, the charities are paid by donators, by people, uh, sometimes by the governments. So they can seek help and advice from uh, these organizations and centers. Sheikhna, um, you know, the youth today and age, I mean, you know, they go out and they educate themselves and they can educate Islamically and also in other sciences. But sometimes our youth are deviated. How do we protect our youth from deviation of any sort in, in, in general, generally speaking? Well, again, it is imperative for the youth leadership, now be it the parents or the community leader or whoever is in charge of the youths, to try to um, protect the young girls and boys from sliding into the uh, deviation and corruption. And of course, that is by teaching them uh, the true beliefs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Day of Judgment and the Hisab and to teach them these values of Islam, that we have a profound belief, we have a strong aqeedah in the hereafter. There's a hisab awaiting for us in the grave. On the very first night of the grave, there's a hisab. The very first day in which the one is uh, uh, 
buried in the grave will be accountable for his deeds. Because to be honest, no one can protect uh, the youths from um, these deviations, nor the, the social services, the government, the police, um, the security services, nobody can protect. They give overall advice and guidance, but nobody can protect and educate them as much as the religious organizations and centers can provide and the, and the scholars can pro provide uh, such guidance and continuous, as I said, mentoring and educating them all the way. Um, otherwise, um, things will be devastating and the, the results of deviation and corruption by the youth would be not only for them, but even the society will, will hurt and we'll see the consequences, which we don't want to see that at all. Now, it's funny you mentioned corruption because corruption is a big issue in our community, um, you know, Islamically and even outside Islam in, in general and, you know, with, within the public, there's the issues of corruption. How do we instill, you know, virtues and morality with our youth to, you know, stop them from being corrupted or being even involved in any sort of corruption at all? Well, when we go back to the time of the Prophet ﷺ, when he established his Islamic government in Medina al-Munawwara, we see that the Prophet ﷺ, he called for many virtues to be implemented in the Muslim society and community. For example, the brotherhood within the Muslims, that the Muslim is the brother of the Muslim. So they won't cheat, they won't fight, they won't hurt each other. They're brothers. Um, the freedom, the freedom in speech, the freedom in activities, the freedom of being able to be free in that uh, geographic location without being chained with uh, man-made laws and uh, in which will have the, um, the consequences on the youth themselves and their society. And of course, um, other virtues such as, for example, non-violence, to be peaceful, not only with your own community, but with all other creeds and, and beliefs, with all religions, to be peaceful, to respect all other, um, um, no, let's say if you're in a major majority, in a minor you respect the minorities, for example. So these teachings in which were established in the time of the Prophet ﷺ should be also implemented today in our own communities and societies more and more. And we try to uh, implement the true aqidah and implement in, in our hearts and in practice as well. And of course, to stick with the ahkam of Allah Taala. In this case, of course, the one may be able to preserve these virtues and spread them to the next coming generations. Ahsan. Sheikhna, what are, because this is really important that we you know we educate our youth because one thing is that, you know, they're Muslims, we want them to grow up as, you know, virtuous, pious people, but at the same time, when they reach the age of balugh, when they reach adolescence, a lot of things become wajib upon our youth. Now, what, what sort of things... What sort of, um, um, I think the, the way we say it in, in the Hawza was uh, taklif is upon the youth once they reach the age of adolescence. You see, there are two main things that the Sayyid mentions in his uh, Risala book with regard to uh, educating and teaching the youth with regard to the Sharia laws. Um, initially is to, uh, to fulfill the obligatory acts in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made them oblige the mu'min to uh, implement them and, and, and practice them. And they are, for example, daily prayers, fasting, uh, paying zakat, hajj, and so forth. These ahkam, uh, the minutes or the day in which that young boy or girl becomes baligh and reach the age of puberty, it becomes wajib in line with the adults. They have reached now the age in which the ahkam will be wajib on them as it is wajib on their parents and their older sisters and brothers. So initially they have to practice these ahkam wajibah. Of course, we shouldn't be harsh on, on them, 
gradually, slowly, slowly. And that's, again, we have to start from early age. So we teach the kids um, the salah, to stand next to us to pray. Let's say in the age of three or four, just a, um, how can we say, um, a mock salah or, or a practice. practice the salah yeah. uh, next to us. Mm. You don't have to ask them to do the wudu as well because mm. they're too young. No. But when they reach the age, for example, of six, seven, eight, gradually you start to tell them to do wudu, teach them how to do wudu, go in the, uh, in the bathroom, mm. teach them yourself to see you how you do the wudu sequentially, and then they do it themselves, and eventually they start to learn uh, the surah, hamd, and the small surah afterwards, how to do the ruku' and sujood, one by one, step by step. In this case, you have fulfilled the first stage of learning and practicing the wajibat from such early age. Um, the second uh, recommendation by the Sayyid is that to t teach them to abstain from all haram acts. So you teach them what is haram. Let's say you teach them that, for example, alcohol is haram to drink. But you can drink juice instead, for example. It's haram to eat meat which was not slaughtered by uh, the uh, means of Islamic uh, method by the Qibla, by the Muslim, and so forth. It is haram to eat pork meat, for example. Um, it is haram, for example, to eat fish with no scales, for mm -hmm. example, except the prawns as exception, and so forth. So we try to teach them these uh, ahkam, the prohibited ones, the haram ones, so they can have this immunity and protection from falling into the acts of ahkam when they reach the age of puberty and, and, and youth. Because in that time, it would be very difficult. Imagine if somebody uh, let their kids to listen to music, to songs. When they reach the age of puberty and, 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 and uh, bulur, you can't tell them, stop listening. Where were you for the past six, seven years? Mm -hmm. You let them off to listen uh, to music, you know, day and night. And, and join music clubs, for example, dance clubs, uh, parties with their friends. Now you want to prevent them? It's very difficult. So you start from the early ages that, listen, this is haram because of one, two, three. You give them uh, uh, the reasons uh, that they can understand, you know, uh, because their mentality are different than the adult's mentality. And gradually, gradually, they build up with this notion and with this uh, Aqeedah and belief and strong uh, understanding that, well, this is the right thing we are doing. Uh, that we don't eat the haram, we don't do the haram, we don't join the haram uh, clubs and so forth. So when they are in the age of bulugh and youth, they are strong. They know what uh, and how to uh, implement these ahkam uh, with the true belief and understanding and with acceptance. That's important. That I internally accept and believe in these ahkam and these rules. To understand that. I think it's very, very important, Sheikh. And you know, what the, the things you highlighted, especially that, you know, from, from a young age that Muslims are rehearsing how to practice their religion, abstaining from haram so they don't develop any bad habits. And inshallah, and develop good habits and mustahabat, you know, to, to, to pray on time and also how to do wudu and then to recite Quran and so forth. Thank you very much, Sheikh Lai, and thank you to all our viewers for joining us. If you have a question that you'd like to propose to the Sheikh, you can email us on uh, SOS at imamhussein.tv, and inshallah, we'll be able to address it. Join us next time for another episode where we'll be discussing uh, the topic on youth, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Ah, 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 ah.